So please give up a round of applause for our panel. Thank you very much for joining us. Hand it over. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So I think this panel sort of represents a, a shift in the industry that um, even a year ago at ArcView, you, you probably wouldn't have heard about. Um, the, the whole industry up until now has pretty much um, done their whole supply chain themselves. People did all of their genetics development in-house and often, and they did all of their cloning themselves in-house. And uh, that's not how other agricultural industries work at all. And I think um, the people on this panel are going to explain um, how it's starting to work in cannabis and, and how it's going to work in the future. Um, we want to cover a couple of things that I, I think investors in particular need to be aware about. Uh, investors need to understand how the supply chain for plants works. And, and I think in general, investors should be thinking about how agriculture works in the real world because cannabis is getting more and more like that. And so it's important to understand uh, how plants are going to flow through that supply chain, how IP law and licensing agreements will structure, how those deals work, and how the supply chain will affect the efficiency of production throughout the industry. Um, and I think it's also important for investors to understand what people really mean when they talk about genetics and, um, and how to evaluate companies that um, make claims about what kind of plants they have um, or what their supply chain looks like in terms of plants. So um, l let me start by asking you guys um, just about the, the first step here, which is the shift to outsourced commercial cloning. Um, you know, we are just now seeing that start to happen. Um, I think it's fair to say that it's only widespread in California. Is, is that right? Dan, do, would you agree? Um, yeah, our perspective is exclusively in California, but um, I think in many ways, as I look around uh, the, the US and internationally, um, the California market in some ways has a more mature supply chain, and certainly that's the case around genetics. Yeah. In California, you know, going back to 2007, um, really we sort of pioneered this nursery space, following on um, a couple of uh, other operators like Oaks Dam Nursery who uh, were progenitors for us. But even going back that far, um, growers, farmers were, you know, not wanting and, and, and were able to not focus on this part of their production. They were able to find good value by coming to nurseries like Darkheart to produce high quality plants, um, to be able to refresh their genetics, make sure that they had um, market competitive genetics every season as they come back. Um, and we certainly think that um, that's a very conventional supply chain from an agricultural perspective. Um, and we think that uh, it will be more and more widely adopted as uh, the market develops uh, more in California and elsewhere. What would you say the, the reasons why, I mean, from, from my perspective, adoption has been slower than I, I would have expected. Um, it, it seems very inefficient for grow operations to have their own mother rooms when those could be converted to flower production. Um, it is known to be inefficient for um, producers in any other crop to do their own clone production. Uh, why has uptake been so slow? Is it because there just haven't been clone companies or are people resistant to it? I think that the entire cannabis um, ecosystem has been very constrained. You know, its development has been constrained by regulation. It's been warped by regulation. It's also been constrained by capital. So in order for this supply chain to mature, nurseries need to scale um, so that they can provide more and more interesting and more and more competitive products. Um, and also those vertically integrated operators need to need to scale. You know, we start need to start um, evaluating these companies on their fundamentals, which will put pressure on them to have more efficient supply chains. And I, I think that's when you'll start to see them look more conventional. Right. Uh, I think you're right. How do you guys think it's it quite works new, in Canada? Right. At least in Canada, commercial production is very new. And so 
everybody's trying to sort out how it all works from start to finish. And we were limited in how we could acquire plants and, and, and then maintain them based on the regulations. So I think that as we move forward, we'll probably see a shift in that, similar to other industries, right? Like Ford Motor Company began making all of their parts. And then one day they realized that if they outsourced things like fenders to someone else who only made fenders, then they could buy those fenders for cheaper than they could make them themselves and, and then have greater proceeds as a result. And so I think we'll see something similar here where when we, if we are going to be great at dried flower production, for example, well then maybe we're, we're going to bring in our cuttings from somewhere else where somebody else is taking care of that step in the process and they're the best at doing that job. And then together we can we can move it forward in more of a manufacturing type of process. Yeah, and of course, you know, not only can that fender producer um, do a great job of producing fenders, but they can also then invest in the technology of fenders, right? Mm -hmm. And that's I think a huge part of this, right? Um, General Motors probably would never have dedicated an R and D budget to fenders, right? But if you're a specialist in fenders, exactly. um, you're going to want to make sure that you have the best and you're delivering the best for your customers. Yeah. And so can. Can we talk about that, Ian? Do you want to address that a little bit? Um, you guys aren't just doing commercial cloning, and I'm actually surprised that there are more people doing just sort of straight commercial cloning. Um, you guys are d doing it using tissue culture, and um, that's a technology that is somewhat complicated. At least it has been very hard for individual producers to get it working. So it. it it, it seems like the kind of technology where you need a specialist company that can invest in it. Can you guys speak to how tissue culture um, really changes the equation around the supply chain and, and why you're doing tissue culture instead of just having a huge factory mother room? Sure, sure. Okay. Is that my name? Hello. All right, thanks. Um, so, you know, the why is an interesting question. Um, when you look at uh, the clonal production of crops, uh, globally, you know, um, papayas, bananas, strawberries, blueberries, raspberries, uh, ferns, bamboo, you know, all of these clonally produced crops uh, have graduated from uh, vegetative propagation, which is the fancy term for making, making clones from a mother plant, uh, to the utilization of tissue culture. And it's really been about uh, solving two key problems for the producer. Um, one of them has to do with pathogens, where um, you know, effectively in a traditional kind of cloning environment, you know, you have a mother plant, you're going to take cuttings from that mother plant, um, and any kind of pathogen issues that are present on the mother are going to carry right over to the, to the young plants. And, uh, you know, that problem is really compounded in the cannabis industry because of the pesticide regulations, right? So, you know, virtually all of the regulated markets have uh, implemented rules that are all but banning the use of pesticides. You know, in Canada, um, you know, growers are here are, are limited essentially to kind of food grade substances. Uh, you know, it's from the regulators kind of perspective. If you can, if you can eat it, it would probably be safe to apply it on the plants. So we're talking about things like baking soda. Um, so, you know, really for the cannabis growers, their hands have been kind of tied when it comes to pesticides. Um, so it really puts uh, a huge challenge, you know, for myself as a longtime operator, you know, I, I would contend that, you know, that early phase of propagation is really the hardest part of the whole process. It's the one piece that we haven't been able to scale. Um, so we're running into these walls with, you know, how do you maintain vegetative plants, uh, you know, without, without really aggressive use of pesticides. So there's the pathogen issue, and then there's also the scale issue. You know, how do you make a million clones a week, right? Um, you know, I in my experience in California, you know, running about 600,000 square feet of greenhouse, you know, we're talking like an acre and a half of mother plants, right? Just to be able to populate that facility, you know, to be able to produce, you know, 50,000 clones a week, you know? So f scaling from that point is extremely difficult. Um, and that's where tissue culture comes in, you know, you see uh, you know, in a uh, crop like uh, uh, ferns, you know, 70% of all the ferns come out of a single tissue culture lab uh, in the Netherlands. So, you know, it's extremely scalable technology. Um, and, uh, you know, as you pointed to, it's, it's a very, uh, a, a fairly advanced technology to develop. You know, at Segra, we're three years into that process now. Um, and, uh, you know, we're really just hitting the point now where we can start commercializing the technology. So. Um, so it's, you know, very new aspect to the industry. 
Um, but I think when you look at you know the real particular challenges in cannabis that we're highlighting, pathogens, scaling, um, you know, it's going to play a really important piece in the future. So. Um, and talk a little bit about how you how you see this evolving. So. Um, for those of you that, that don't know, um, some plants uh, you can only really propagate as clones because seeds don't breed true. Um, but with crops that you can use seeds for, um, typically those crops are produced uh, with seeds in the rest of agriculture. How do you see that evolving for cannabis? Because cannabis is relatively unique in the fact that you can do both effectively. I'd love to jump on that question. Our, our perspective, I think, is a little bit different than Ian's. Um, we've done uh, tissue culture quite a bit. Um, I think we had one of, if not the first uh, commercial lab in the industry um, and have worked with that quite a bit and still make most of our plants through um, traditional clonal propagation. Um, frankly, though, like our long-term production perspective is that cannabis will be a seed-produced crop. Um, the reasons that that's not done now primarily have to do with the immaturity of, of the seed that's available in cannabis. Um, for an annual crop like cannabis, it almost always is produced by seed. Um, it's the by far the most cost-effective method. When we look at comparables, um, of course, there are many crops that are produced in using any type of production system, tissue culture, clonal, seed-based. Um, there are good reasons to use any of those uh, systems for the right crop. Um, but what we tend to see is that the cost of production um, tends to be relatively high for tissue culture plants. Uh, t tends to be about 50% less or so for clonally produced crops. And the big savings that you get is when you start producing from seed. I mean, we're talking about uh, several orders of magnitudes less. You go from, you know, even with clonal propagation like we do, uh, you know, at a cost of 20 to 30 cents a plant to something more like one or two cents a plant. That's, that's really where we think the... Um, the future lies, but that takes a lot of work. That takes breeding work. It takes work to um, stabilize the varietals and make sure that um, that we have very high quality seed, preferably hybrid, stabilized seed varietals, feminized seed varietals. Um, that's the work that that um, you know Darkheart and others, I think, are hoping to put into it. Um, and Sarah, how do, how do you look at this from a producer point of view? Do you um, you know are, are you planning ahead in terms of how this will affect your supply chain? Are you um, doing breeding work yourself that will feed into this issue? So not currently. We intend to develop a breeding program at some point in, in the future, but uh, in Canada, at least, it's been a difficult road to acquire genetics, actually. And so because Health Canada has changed, they, they have moved the bar a few times. And so it, uh, LPs that got in during the MMP are, were able to declare genetics in their possession uh, when they applied for their license. So, so they could have upwards of 150, 200 different types of, of varietals. But then in the, in the mean, so, so they moved forward and then we moved into the ACMPR and then Health Canada changed the rules so that you had to purchase, any new LPs had to purchase from existing LPs and there was different structures in how that could be done. And so some companies were selling the genetics, but at a premium price. And in most cases, it wasn't the premium genetics because you were selling directly to your competition. And so that's not obviously a, an amazing business model. Uh, so you get something somewhere in the middle. And then other companies were selling with royalties attached. And so you could pay anywhere between six cents and six dollars per cutting in perpetuity. So th that's also a, a great expense over over time. Uh, and so Health Canada has since now realized that that's not optimal. And so now comes the Cannabis Act, and now you can, we're once again in the situation where new applicants can do a declaration to have varietals in their possession legally that's vetted by the uh, RCMP and, and things like that. But us in the middle are still trying to work out a breeding program and we'll have to partner hopefully with other companies and hopefully we'll end up in a situation more like, like you're in where you can sell genetics in a different way. And w would you say that to address that, um, is it fair to guess that a lot of the big LPs are um, applying for new licenses so that they can have a immaculate conception period through that license? I think so, but the queue is very long, so it's not a, a quick fix in that case. 
but I think that yes, uh, the Health Canada also now, there's a number of different licenses that you can get, right? So there's a nursery license that you can apply for, there's the a micro go let grow license, and so as an existing producer, you could apply for one of those licenses, but you, you don't get preferential treatment, right? You're at the end of this rather long queue. Yeah. Uh, Ian, can I ask, is, is the nursery license in Canada the one you have? Yeah, well we're applying, we're a late stage applicant right now uh, for a nursery license. And does so it have some advantage over a traditional production license? Oh, definitely, yeah. Uh, the big advantages are in regulatory oversight. So, you know, they've really scaled back the, uh, you know, security requirements, reporting requirements, uh, you know, from the regulator's perspective. So they're looking at the nursery where, you know, we're not managing any flowering plants. So, yeah. you know, the liabilities around theft and all of those things are, are much more accessible. So we're very hopeful we'll be one of the first uh, licensed nurseries in, in Canada. Um, sir, sir, so do you, uh, do you know if there are any companies at all in Canada that are just supplying genetics that, that have spun up to, to be breeders at and, and supply this need that all the producers have? So I don't think there's anyone doing that so far. Um, there are a lot of the big companies are all because so as one of the middle ones, we you know you purchase some number of genetics, but then it's it's very difficult to have the full spectrum of what clients require or desire, right? And so so then you also end up buying bulk cannabis for filling those gaps in 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 your genetic library, right? And so I think that we're going to see a change in that as more nurseries licenses come online who will be doing similar things to what you're doing and and selling genetics at, at a different in a different type of so business model so can you guys try to tell me what you think it will look like when that happens L let's say it's it's a year and a half from now in canada um or in california even and large producers are getting rid of their mother rooms and they're outsourcing their clone supply um, how is that going to feed into their genetic catalog? So presumably they'll be depending on the clone provider to have a wide diversity of interesting and appropriate stuff for them to buy. What if they have proprietary varieties that they want to run? Can you help them with that? Can they give them to you and have you tissue culture them? Or how, how do you see that working? Well, I, I can tell you how we handle that in California. Um, you know, we, we can do exactly that. We'll provide uh, nursery product as a service. We frequently come across this. Um, I think that in a lot of ways, I mean, obviously we're the nursery propagator, but the breeding ecosystem in California is really um, hugely enmeshed. I mean, we have breeders coming out of the woodwork in California that have been developing genetic libraries for decades or sometimes even generations. Very interesting varietals. Um, I tell people, you have to think of California breeding, you know, California is to cannabis breeding like what Italy is to the fashion industry, right? There's like, uh, you know, new launches every two or three months, you know, and um, you have these this intense consumer demand for some of these varietals that come out. Um, so it really does move the market, and there is some, uh, you know, proprietary, there's some proprietary interest in some of these varietals that, that some of our groups propagate. So um, the way that we, we handle that now is through um, proprietary um, programs where we'll bring in um, your private genetics and we can produce them on your behalf exclusively. Um, and then of course, we also gain access to, um, we're able to tap into this vast, um, this vast ecosystem of genetics by um, developing our breeding ecosystem, which we do through licensing agreements with breeders throughout California. Um, that allows us to have access to the best genetics on the market at all times. And it's a really good fit for our breeding partners because um, it helps them they get to use our, our platform to really get the, their best work out to market. So, so let's talk about that, about licensing and IP for a minute. Um, so there's a robust infrastructure for IP for every other crop. There are plant patents and utility patents and plant variety protection. Um, some of those things are sort of slowly coming online for cannabis, but there's not enforcement and it's not a robust system. Um, and I believe, Correct me if you think I'm wrong, that for, for a while, uh, licensing contracts in markets where they can be enforced will be a driver for how, how this stuff starts to work, um, especially as you start to get a supply chain where there's specialization, so everything's not happening in-house. You're relying on other people to bring you your starts. Um, how do you guys see these licensing agreements 
working. And, and for instance, um, I'd like to ask both of you, um, when you get a variety from a breeder, um, what does that deal look like? And how do you, how do you compensate them? And, and how do you keep your, your library diverse? Talk about that a little bit. So, you know, I think uh, you know, it's important to keep in mind that, you know, really in the big picture, cannabis breeding is in its infancy, right? You know, we're just beginning to see the entry of, you know, really modern breeding uh, tools, molecular breeding tools, uh, you know, all the stuff that, you know, the big guys have been using for years to produce super plants, essentially, you know, um, you know, genetically engineered plants resistant to disease, et cetera. And that technology as we speak, is descending on the cannabis industry. So, uh, you know, as, a, as an early adopter in the nursery space, you know, when we kind of look at the genetic landscape right now, um, uh, you know, there's, a, there's a, um, a lot of the same stuff out there. You know, there's not a whole lot of really kind of novel um, cultivars to draw from yet. Um, and as the nursery, uh, you know, what we really see kind of looking into the future is that, you know, say, you know, two to three years from now, um, we're going to see these plants that are, um, you know, highly improved over what we have to work with right now. And as, as the nursery, kind of within our model, um, we're trying to kind of serve as the gatekeeper where, you know, you have these, uh, you know, breeders doing this incredible work to develop these new plants. Um, you know, I think the, the proper positioning for the nursery is really to, you know, kind of have two sets of clients. You have the genetic providers um, that, you know, you have to be building that relationship with um, you know, so although they don't have, you know, these super plants I'm speaking of yet, they're coming. Um, and then we have the client as the, uh, uh, the, the producer and the grower. So, you know, we kind of find ourselves, you know, sandwiched in the middle. And, you know, our goal is really to build relationships on both sides and, uh, you know, to comment on the licensing, um, you know, for the, uh, the plant breeder, um, it's an extremely exciting proposition to have the ability to partner with a nursery that can bring those cultivars to life. Um, uh, you know, this is one place that, you know, in kind of the debate about clone versus uh, uh, seed, you know, where there's a very interesting proposition for the breeders within clone or tissue culture, where, you know, that new variety can be created, it can be genotyped, and then the nursery can essentially replicate that plant exactly uh, guarantee the integrity of it, um, which is which is difficult uh, for the plant breeder working from seed. So typically, your 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 breeders right now, you know, they're they're lucky to sell a handful of seeds. Generally, you know, it's being sold to a producer. The producer's growing them out, selecting their own plants, etc. So, you know, the nursery provides this really interesting opportunity for the breeders to have a partnership that allows them to ha really have a large reach, um, and in an environment where they can protect that that IP uh, to an extent. And so, what would you, what kind of, um, in the current landscape, how can you help breeders protect their IP? I mean, don't, don't many of them have concerns about having those genetics released in clonal form that could be taken pretty easily? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that is a, a big concern right now, and, and not just a concern, but a, a fact of life for most breeders in the cannabis space, certainly in California. Um, you know, again, we can protect, uh, it depends on what the breeder is looking for. I mean, we can protect those by uh, keeping a tight ecosystem um, in which they also go to other contracted parties. Um, but, you know, especially in California right now, we're, we're pre-metric. There's, there's a lot of leakage out of, uh, you know, out of that, that program. Um, and so, frankly, what it's done is it's really shaped the way that breeding is done um, and, and it's, it's driven this um, product life cycle, this quick product life cycle in um, California, at least, um, where, you know, the genetics are really, they're, it's really like a quarterly release. You know, I mean, you're, you're, you're launching this quarter, you're capturing your revenue from, I mean, for the breeders, from their perspective anyway, you're, you know, launching this quarter, you're doing your marketing, you're, you're promoting the, the brand new um, genetics. Um, and then you're on to the next thing, you know, by next quarter or certainly the quarter after that, um, you're looking at what are the, what are the unique varietals you're going to release after that. And yeah. so that kind of fast turnover makes um, innovation more important than IP protection really. Is that, is that kind of what you're saying? That's the way it is right now. I mean, that needs to change because what it means is that um, the type of investment that we need to see to really mature the crop itself, um, breeders aren't investing in, right? 
Um, and that's why we're really eager for this intellectual property, especially this patent system, to start maturing um, so that um, the people that are doing this work can invest more in it and do a, do a much better job. Yeah, what do you think about Canada. the IP situation, Sarah? Yeah, so, so plant genetics are protected in some ways by the, the Plant Breeders' Rights Act, right? And so I think a search... Uh, just, just in Canada, for, for the moment, just in Canada. Yeah, that's right. And so uh, if you did a search a couple years ago, you would have found, I think, two uh, hemp varietals that were that were protected, three others that were being reviewed, and two cannabis varieties. And now if you look, it's like there's 78 applications in now. So I think it is something that people are thinking about uh, and, and really trying to, to move in the direction of owning rights to, to the genetics that they're breeding. And it is, it's a complex thing to do, to, to breed plants and, and, well, cannabis plants. And I think that the trend has changed as well. You know, in the early 2000s, as I was working in plant breeding, we were all breeding for higher THC, higher THC, higher THC. And now I think we've seen a shift. It's more high CBD that, that is being focused on. But I think after we've seen the talks recently that we're getting a better understanding of how these compounds work in the body and, and how they can treat uh, different, different um, ailments. And having a better understanding of how that works could then lead into a breeding program that would be targeting a more a specific type of whole plant uh, project. Right, like, sin since you bring that up, l let's talk about traits for a little bit. Um, you guys have been talking about how there's going to be a new generation of improved cannabis or super plants. Um, what's that going to look like? How are those plants going to differ from the plants today? Well, I would uh, almost reframe the question. Um, you know, I, I think I don't think so much about super plants in cannabis. I mean, we, we have like interesting plants now. Um, in some ways, the super plant phenomenon is what's happened in the past in cannabis, right? We've developed, you know, Blue Dream was you know a huge breeding success. You know, it yielded so much more, and and um, it you know we've we've gotten cannabinoids and we've gotten terpenes where we want them to be. Those are like all sort of super plants. The breeding of the future, I think, is, is much less about super plants and more about super crop systems, right? Um, in other words, you know, you can't dissect breeding from the rest of the, the crop production system, right? No one, um, you, don't, you don't breed a plant in a vacuum. You breed a plant for a purpose, for a place, um, to solve a problem, to be cultivated in a certain type of system, right? Um, to put this in context, I was speaking with a, a corn breeder recently. Uh, she works for a very large uh, uh, corn breeding fr firm, and they, they looked at 50 years of data of their corn breeding program, and they said, boy, haven't we done a great job improving yields? And this, you know, it's doubled the yields over 50 years, tremendous success story. How have we done that? And they looked at plant yields, and they, not, they hadn't changed in 50 years. The per plant yields had not changed. What changed was they changed the morphology of the plants so they could be planted more densely, right? So planting the crop more densely, you know, being able to mechanically plant that crop more densely, um, apply fertilizers in a way more intensely. That's what turned the yield over, right? So when we're talking about modern breeding programs, we're not, I think, talking about the old days where we have, um, you know, someone in a, in a basement, you know, making a cross and then selecting the best varietal among that cross. We're talking about cross-functional teams that are coming together, pathologists, agronomists, um, breeders to come together and think not just about the plant itself, but how is the plant being cultivated and how can we optimize that? In a reasonable amount of space also, right? 